all over our cities, along our coastlines and across our green and pleasant land, an invisible army is fighting a never-ending war. Their enemy is the filth that we create and the vermin that thrive on it. Welcome to the hidden world of the Grime Fighters. On Grime Fighters tonight, pest controller Pete finds an infestation of cockroaches. If you come here at night, the floor would actually get up and literally move. Restaurant inspector Johnny finds something lurking in a dustbin of rice. It doesn't really bear thinking about uh, what would happen if that got into somebody's mouth. An extreme cleaner Nick even finds religion. Wherever you go, in squats or anything, there's always a Bible. Let's look in this room first. What immediately confronts Nick is surely a landlord's worst fears. Occupants with no respect at all for the newly refurbished property they and obviously their dogs moved into. Yeah, this smells pretty bad. It kind of smells, got that dead body smell to it, to be fair. Dried dog feces down there. You know, it's just, just really dirty. Got another room in here. Um, again, it's just sort of just rubbish that they've collected and chucked around. Always find a Bible. Always. Don't know why. Wherever you go, in squats or anything, there's always a Bible. Which makes me think the people that are living here are trying to find an answer to, to the solution of life, but there is no answer. Apart from dog poo littering the wooden floors and a revolting sofa in the kitchen, the downstairs isn't too bad. But what horrors may be waiting for Nick as he climbs the stairs? When it comes to grime, graffiti is one of the biggest problems facing our inner cities. In London alone, it costs the taxpayer over £100 million a year to wage war on the so-called graffiti artists. Here in Dagenham, Darren and his graffiti removal team are trying, as always, to stay one step ahead of the perpetrators, who are using even more sophisticated paints and sprays to make the graffiti much more difficult to remove. For his part, Darren has an armoury of jet washers and special gels to get rid of the graffiti, but in some cases, like these scribblings on the local bowling club's walls, good old-fashioned methods are still the best way forward. Well, with this one, um, we're going to find it easy to actually paint this out, and if we start jetting inside there, we're going to actually rip the render off the wall. So it's easy to just paint straight over the top there and clean it all up. There's a remorseless inevitability about Darren's job. He's seen this wall many times before. This wall alone, oh dear, must be, I suppose at least once every two months. I mean, so literally, it could be overnight. The guys could come back tonight, see that it's been painted over, and they'll go straight back over the top again with the spray paint. How does that make you feel? Well, I suppose a little bit disheartened, but keeps us in work. In Peckham, Steve and James are making a start on clearing the three-bedroom house as Nick ventures upstairs to check out the state of the bedrooms. OK, this is a bit more like it. This is the, generally the kind of thing you expect to find probably throughout a whole house. Even though this bedroom is typical of what Nick finds, it doesn't get any easier for him to understand the mentality of the squatters. It's just, just disrespect, really. Disrespect to the owners and disrespectful to themselves. You know, no one with any self-respect would live like this. Again, <laughs> whenever I drive past houses and I see sheets and curtains up in windows, I know exactly what's inside those places. You can't be bothered to go to Ikea and buy a blind. This is the sort of thing you live in. As Nick checks out another bedroom, he spies a cup on top of the wardrobe. These have caught him out in the past. Often in these places, you've got to be careful of cups with on them on top of wardrobes. You start moving a wardrobe and you can end up with uh, someone's urine all over you. But the bedroom has yet to offer up its nicest surprises. They've got their own fridge in here. Oh, look at that. Growing in the bottom. <laughs> oh, that stinks. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Rotten onions. I think they're onions. If it smells like that, can still make me gag slightly. It's just... <laughs> Microwave. Oh, that's a beauty. Look at that. Fish. Fish head, and that looks like a fish eye. Now Nick's checked out the lie of the land, time to get a plan of action. The plan of action will be clear downstairs. Um, got to try and get the boards off to get access to the back. And then clear upstairs. Then once all the rubbish is out, rip up the carpets. And then um, start cleaning. 
for the thousands of professionals keeping us filth free around the country, the job of the restaurant inspectors is surely one of the most important for our public well-being. Here in Wolverhampton, John and Faye's daily job is to make sure that behind the welcoming facade of the multitude of restaurants, the public are as safe as they can be from possible bad food hygiene in the kitchens. Today is a surprise visit to an Indian restaurant that in the past has become a regular haunt. The premises has been a problem in the past, but I believe they may be under new proprietorship, so um, they're sort of their past history wouldn't necessarily be taken into consideration. The worst that could happen is that we find um, sort of rodent activity, either rats or mice, um, and if we can determine that it's an active um, infestation, then the, the premises would be shut down. After politely gaining entry, John and Faye can now go about their inspection. First impressions of the kitchen, however, don't look that good. The kitchen looks very cluttered, uh, and ideally you, you wouldn't have clutter in the kitchen. You want to be able to have a food premises which is easy to keep clean. Um, one of the major problems with too much clutter in a kitchen is that you're not, easy, you're not able to easily identify rodent activity. One of the things we sort of look for is, is if there's um, food lying around at room temperature. Obviously food needs to be kept under temperature control conditions um, to ensure that it, the particular problem with rice is that rice, um, you actually get spores forming in rice um, and the problem is you can't kill those spores okay and they'll actually produce a toxin and no amount of reheating would actually um, remove that toxin from the food. So we'd be looking for, for them to be keeping food uh, in the fridge under temperature control conditions and in particular foods like rice. Very quickly the threat of toxins from room temperature rice pale into insignificance with another of John's discoveries. One problem I've just found, uh, I've looked in a large container of rice here and unfortunately what we've got is a screw, a large masonry screw which is obviously uh, something you don't want to see in rice and would be particularly unpleasant if that ended up on someone's plate but it, it doesn't really bear thinking about uh, what would happen if that got into somebody's mouth. Um, so I'm pleased I'm, I found it really, rather than, a, rather than a diner. After the extra ingredient in the rice, the Poppadom cupboard is next on the agenda. I can, I can see that they've got a, a cabinet here which they're using to keep, to keep foods warm. Again, minor cleaning issues, you know, there's accumulation there of food perhaps hasn't been cleaned for a while. Things like poppadoms, they're a ready-to-eat food, so it's really important that they're protected against any source of contamination. So perhaps cleaning appears to be an issue. With the storage of the rice and the poppadoms already conspiring against the proprietor, let's just hope things are set to improve. Embarking, Peter the Pest Controller has arrived at a premises to continue his confrontation with one of the country's most unwelcome household guests. Right, we're embarking and I've uh, got a cockroach job. Um, I was called out yesterday uh, and the infestation's quite bad, so I've got to come back and sort it out more thorough and seriously. Cockroaches are one of the most difficult pests to eradicate. Legend has it that they are the only creatures that could survive a nuclear holocaust. They also spread diseases like dysentery, typhoid and gastroenteritis. All in all a revolting and formidable opponent for Peter. I come here yesterday and I found loads of cockroaches, all different sizes, from nymphs to adults on all the cupboard areas. If we can have a look in this one here, as you can see, we've got a couple of cockroaches down the side here. Most jobs I'd go to, you only see telltale signs, which are like all black dots from the faeces, which gives you evidence that there is cockroaches there. They're more nocturnal. If you've got any big infestation, as we've got in this kitchen, you will actually see them running around during the day, as I will point them out going around, because I can see a few now. If you can see one, you can identify the species, which we've got the German cockroach here. But this house, for some reason, if you can see loads of them running around, which you can, you know that the festation's been going on for a long time. If you come here at night, the floor would actually get up and literally move. All the cupboard areas will move. I've spoke to the owner as well, and she said it's a nightmare. For Peter, and most importantly his clients, to have a chance at all of getting rid of the cockroaches, understanding their life cycle and how they live is vital to potential success. I'll carry this around uh, for the people, as you see the owner here and I'll explain like there's the adults which we have here and then you've got the egg capsule which is that at the back which they carry 
then you've got your nymph, and then your nymph stage, as you can see, as they're getting bigger, as they molt out, they get bigger and bigger. And then on the last molt, they produce the wing cases, and then that's how you get the adults, which then sexually mature for breeding again. This life cycle lasts about three months, and in that time, a single female will release thousands of eggs to add to the infestation. To get rid of cockroaches, the only successful way is the use of poison. The one thing you mustn't ever do is tread on them. You'd never ever crush the cockroach, especially females. If you stamp on them, you're dispersed in the eggs. The eggs are going to hatch out anyway. So you don't want to spread the infestation even bigger. Coming up in part two, John and Faye make some horrible discoveries in the Indian restaurant. Nick clears the house in Peckham, Darren gets called to an emergency, and Peter coaxes out the cockroaches. Throughout the country, an army of professionals are continuing to dedicate their daily lives to waging war on the nation's grime. In Dagenham, Essex, Darren and his graffiti team have made short work of painting out the graffiti on the bowling club's walls. Their next job is a row of garages nearby. Amazingly, not everyone is happy to see Darren and the boys. Some people, believe it or not, don't want the graffiti cleared. They're just quite happy to just leave it there. When it comes to painting out the graffiti on black or white surfaces, that's no problem. But Dagenham Council's graffiti team go to great lengths to try and get the right paint colour for each job. A deep russet red is required for these particular doors in the row. We haven't got a match for this, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a word have with have our guys. I've done a paint match and it's come out of burgundy, so we're going to get that paint ordered for the lady. And we'll come back tomorrow and we'll, uh, we'll finish that off for her. But as the lads get stuck in, Darren gets a call. Just a phone call. Hello? OK then, mate. Yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll go straight over. All right, then? All right, see you in a little while. Bye. 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 Right, we've been called off this. We've got an emergency dog job to do. We've got a, a large paint spillage down at Lodge Avenue. So uh, we're going to have to stop doing this graffiti now, and uh, we've got to go over there and clear it all up. <laughs> In Wolverhampton, restaurant inspectors John and Fay are continuing their unannounced inspection of the local Indian restaurant. Already they found a masonry screw in a bucket of rice and the poppadom cupboard didn't get the thumbs up. It looks like things might be getting even worse with a good look at a chopping board. Another sort of issue I've found is the, the condition of this chopping board. OK, as you can see, heavily scored um, and there's even sort of mould accumulation. Um, now the problem with heavily scored chopping boards is that the scores um, will harbour bacteria and once the chopping board's got into this sort of condition as you can see it's quite sort of porous you can't keep it clean pretty unpleasant really so this chopping board is um, good for the bin general cleanliness of a kitchen can tell a lot about how it's run and how the staff are dealing with more serious issues like cross-contamination of food consequently john is always eager to check in the darkest recesses of an establishment the floors under the worktops need cleaning every three days a quick look with the torch will reveal all what i can sort of see under here is that there's an accumulation of food debris it's important to distinguish between what's from today uh, and what's been there for a while um, and I can see from looking at here uh, that some of this has been here for quite some time. For example, there's a, what appears to be a rotten potato. Uh, it just shows that, you know, somebody's not taken a brush to the floor. Not only are the kitchen staff seemingly not sweeping under the cabinets, Faye has now discovered even the most rudimentary cleanliness can't really be achieved. When did the soap run out? Did you not want to buy any more soap? No. no. OK. You're happy with the fairy liquid? OK. John is also finding out that the lack of hand soap isn't the only problem when it comes to the washing up. We've got a container uh, being used for storage of, of cleaning equipment. Now, as you can see, you know, you probably can't smell it. Um, we've got cleaning cloths which are just in, a, in an atrocious state, really, covered in food debris, uh, in a poor condition. If you're using something to clean, it's obviously got to be clean. You can't clean with dirty equipment. Also here, <clears throat> we've got a colander, which obviously they've, they've done a bit of a DIY job on it. You can see where they've drilled the holes bigger. Now what that's actually left behind is, is sharp metal shards, which could come off into food and again, end up on somebody's plate. 
Um, so again, that's the sort of equipment that just needs to go in the bin. Natural knockers number eight. In Peckham, South London, Nick and his team are making good progress with the three bedroom house, clearing out the rubbish and preparing the house for a deep clean tomorrow. But Nick's feeling a bit worse for wear. I've hit a brick wall now. <laughs> I'm starting to get f***ed off with the people who put me in this situation. The landlord's given express orders for the boys to just get rid of everything from the house. But instead of disposing of it all in the truck, Steve's going to make the next door neighbour's day. Yeah, we're just delivering this fridge for that lady there. She's saying outside the property and wants it. So she can have it. Nick, on the other hand, is still in a grump with the squatters. Just people who obviously don't give a monkeys about how they, uh, they live, quite frankly. Um, how you'd want to live in this smell, I don't understand. And I imagine the shower's pretty clean because I doubt they've used that, so we'll find out anyway. Well, he's right that the shower hasn't been used, at least for washing. To me, that looks like someone's just used it as a toilet. That looks like urine to me. So I would imagine the only use of that shower has been as a, a, fourth, as a third toilet. Nice. With most of the rubbish now cleared, all that's left is to get rid of the dog-stained carpets. Removing all the carpets now, um, they're unsalvageable, obviously dogs have been urinating in them, on them and doing whatever else, so they're not worth saving, you can't save them, so just rip them up, get rid of them, basically. Taking the carpets up reveals the legacy of the dog urine and faeces, something that Nick will tackle tomorrow in the deep clean, but already the house is beginning to look normal again and Nick's cheering up. These are the jobs we like, we're allowed to get a bit of satisfaction seeing everything cleared out, because most people don't want to touch it. You know, the lady whose house this is wouldn't, wouldn't even come through the front door. It's all done now, um, it's not too late in the day. And uh, we've got, you know, everything programmed in for tomorrow. So yeah, no problems today, easy. Over in Barking, Peter, the council's pest controller, is preparing to unleash his tube of poison on the unsuspecting infestation of cockroaches. To them though, they'll initially think it's Christmas. If a kid wanted a lollipop or see any sweets, they would run for the sweets before they would eat their dinner. And that's the same with this, which I can actually show you in this house by putting a little drop down and watching them run to it straight away. The cockroaches are normally nocturnal, but it just takes a little drop of the poison to coax them out of their slumbers. It's secondary poisoning. Uh, once the adults eat it, or the nymphs eat it, if they die, and an, an adult uh, will eat another adult, which is dead, or eat a nymph, which is dead, then they will get secondary poisoning and they will die. As Peter starts to inject the sweet tasting poison wherever he can that's safe to the children in the house, it gives him a little time to reflect. I love this job. It's one of the best jobs I've found on destroying stuff. I do a lot of hunting anyway. Um, I've got firearms, I do a lot of deer stalking, but the best thing I enjoy more than anything is catching rats. I know it sounds silly about going hunting, but I do like conservation as well or especially the endangered species. I mean, if the German cockroach becomes endangered and we found them, I'd probably I'd try and set up some form of group and try and get them back together again. After injecting the poison all over the kitchen, it's going to be about four weeks before Peter knows whether his plan has worked, but he's sure it will. All the cockroaches will go and I'm very confident. Come back in four weeks and you'll see a difference. You've got to be confident in this game, because if you're not, you're letting yourself down and you're letting the public down. And at the end of the day, that's what I'm here for, to help the public. In Dagenham, Darren and the graffiti removal team have arrived at their emergency call-out, a large spill of yellow paint strewn all over the road. The first thing for Darren to do is ascertain what kind of paint it is. If it's gloss, that could be a nightmare. If it's emulsion, the job should be pretty easy. It looks like it's emulsion. I mean, hopefully if it's emulsion. If it's a gloss, then we'll have to go other way. We'll have to put chemical down, try and get it, you know, get it removed. But, I mean... It does seem to be an emotion. It looks like an emotion, so hopefully it'll just rinse away and that'll be it then. Very quickly, after Chris breaks out the power washer, it becomes apparent they've got a result. Well, as you can see there, we've virtually cleaned up the area now. Most of the paint's gone now. We're quite happy with the results there. That looks good. In Wolverhampton, John and Faye have finished their inspection of the Indian restaurant. They found that the establishment's cleaning of kitchen equipment and surfaces isn't up to scratch, and also more attention needs to be paid to cross-contamination in the fridge. 
John and Faye always allow time for proprietors to put things right, so for the time being, the restaurant is getting a stay of execution. I was just explaining that we're probably going to revisit in about a month's time um, because there's um, a few cleaning issues um, and cleaning has been an issue in the past um, but the proprietor isn't here at the moment so I've just obtained his contact telephone number, his mobile and I'm going to speak to him and then do a revisit in about a month. For all the inspectors it's not so much about being heavy handed and closing food businesses down, it's about educating the cultural mix of eateries in Wolverhampton about the British laws they have to comply with, but at the same time making sure that the inspectors are fully aware of what all the diverse religions in the city require. We also try and sort of keep abreast of different sort of religions and what they eat and their beliefs so we, we you know we're not sort of trying to ask them to do something which is totally against the, the religion and their, their beliefs really. And with over 500 restaurants and 300 takeaways in Wolverhampton alone, it's a constant balance that John and Faye relish. Since the filming of the show, the landlord of the three-bed house has easily relet the property, and after Johnny and Faye's return visit, the Indian restaurant has cleaned up its act.